Hello, everyone, and welcome to Simple Insights, a series of interviews with today's leading thinkers in the field of civilization design, collective intelligence, and conscious evolution. In a world confronted with global warming, pandemics, increasing inequality, and political polarization, Simple Insights aims to bring light to the darkness and chart a course towards a cooperative global society. Today, I'm deeply honored to be speaking to one of the preeminent evolutionary biologists alive today, David Sloan Wilson. David is Distinguished Professor of Biological Sciences and Anthropology at Binghamton University, and along with the late evolutionary biologist of the same name, E.O. Wilson, not to be confused, David has been at the forefront of the intellectual battle to put cooperation back on the evolutionary map. And he's famous for the phrase, selfishness beats altruism within groups, but altruistic groups beat selfish groups, and everything else is commentary. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. So you've obviously published a lot of non-fiction before, um, but Atlas Hugged is your first work of fiction. So what prompted you to make the switch? Well, there's several reasons um, uh, for that. Uh, my dad is a novelist, and I sometimes describe myself as a novelist trapped inside the body of a scientist. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and a lot of my nonfiction work is is you know, high on storytelling. So uh, that's one thing. But uh, the main thing is that when I started to get deeply into economics from an evolutionary perspective, which is now quite a few years ago, at a workshop I organized, someone said, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't somebody be doing what Ayn Rand did, which was to take this greed is good ideology and to portray it in fictional form. That was so powerful and influential. Shouldn't somebody be doing that for our ideas for economics from an evolutionary perspective. So put that together with my novelistic background and, and literally within minutes, the title Atlas Hugged floated into my mind and the beginning of a plot line. So it was irresistible for me to repeat Ayn Rand's act for uh, an evolutionary worldview. And it took many, many years. And so this is something which I did in parallel with my whole science and nonfiction work, um, and they co-evolved with each other. This is a case of uh, life imitating art and art imitating life. Yeah, I, I love the, I mean, I'm a big fan of evenomics as well, which I know you're involved with. Um, and I, I read uh, The right. Origin of Wealth by Eric Beinhocker. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by right. the way that evolution can explain you know, concepts and, and can spread into other disciplines and inform them. Um, and just I'm to give a, um, a Robert, just to give a shout out, just to give a shout out for some of our mutual influences. Um, uh, Eric Beinhocker's book, The Origin of Wealth, was the first book I read when I started to immerse myself in economics. And I've been working with Beinhocker ever since. So before we started podcasting, you mentioned John Stewart as someone who influenced uh, uh, you, an evolutionary um uh thinker and so this is part of the uh universe that's coming together around this this uh area call it conscious evolution call it this view of life um this is uh, what's coming together and which uh, i portray in novelistic form and in, uh, in um, atlas hugged yeah it, it is incredibly exciting it does certainly feel like a new paradigm um and it's it's you know so i just always find it almost like a relief when I when I read this view of Life magazine or I come across Eric Beinhocker's book and it's just like, oh, thank God I'm not alone in this, in this um, you know, pushing this new way of looking at things. Um, so yes, in the book, uh, you take aim at Ayn Rand's individual, indiv individualistic philosophy of objectivism, which is no surprises given your um, emphasis on cooperation <laughs> and your intellectual work. Um, the protagonist's mother even describes objectivism as a cancer. And this is more than just a trivial analogy, isn't it? It is. Uh, thank you for picking that out. Cancer is a major theme in the book. And what real cancer is, is basically natural selection taking place within our bodies, between cells within our bodies. A cancer cell is perversely adaptive compared to the neighboring cells. Uh, evolution is all about surviving and reproducing better than others in your vicinity, and that's what cancer cells do so well. Evolution has no foresight. So the fact that cancer cells ultimately bring about their own demise is uh, only to be expected. A great book on actual cancer is titled The Cheating Cell by Athena Actopis. That came out last year, Princeton University 
Press. And uh, once you get the hang of multi-level selection, then when you frame shift up, then cheating behaviors that accounts for the title of Athena's book is a kind of social cancer. In a small group, a cheater is succeeding for themselves at the expense of their group. And then at the societal scale, then we could talk about that individualistic greed is good philosophy as something which is successful for those who hold it, but cancerous as far as the body politic is concerned. And so the, this, this concept of cancer is something that we need to take very, very seriously. And that's why it appears at numerous junctures woven actually throughout the throughout uh, Atlas Hug. Yeah, and it's interesting that, you know, the, the two biggest proponents of, a, of the greed is good philosophy within the book, um, both themselves are diagnosed with cancer. Um, I've certainly <laughs> daydreamed about whether there's a connection between the way you behave, you know, in society and, and, and you know, the cellular selfishness within your body. I suppose we have to leave that to just conjecture at this point. Um, but it's certainly interesting. Um, well, so the nice thing about uh, 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 Robert, the nice thing about fiction is that you can you can um, have that kind of poetic justice, even if it doesn't occur in the real world. You can have that kind of poetic justice, which does occur in a uh, uh, a fictional world, and kind of makes things right. Uh, um, so the idea that what you can do in fiction, just as a kind of as a writing aside, that you cannot do in nonfiction. Um, it's very liberating. I mean, I, I love writing in all its forms, uh, but uh, um, the, the fictional uh, medium, oh my heavens, it was like a different league in terms of how much fun it was to, to have that kind of elbow room to make things happen. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can imagine. I mean, it can be constraining, of course, the academic discipline. You have to be so careful about what you say. Everything has yep. to be so well evidenced. Um, exactly. Must be nice just to, you know, speculate a bit. Um, that's yeah. In many ways, what makes what makes me freer as a, as a, as a outside the realms of academia is that I can draw on all the knowledge, but I'm not. I don't. I don't have to. You know, if 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 uh, I can imagine a bit outside it. Um, and actually, one of the mm -hmm. questions I was going to ask you is: you draw a distinction in the book between um, people who are interested in the pursuit of truth, which is quite rare, I think, as you point out, and people who perform a kind of mosaic artistry. Um, which is basically sort of selecting facts to prop up a preconceived worldview and maybe discarding a few that don't sit so comfortably. Um, and I wonder, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I asked myself the extent to which I'm either a genuine truth seeker or a mosaic artist. Um, but is there something about human nature that is inherently drawn to stories and therefore by definition a certain amount of mosaic artistry and and and, and does that explain why scientific journals rarely set the world alight uh, uh, great i'm so happy that you're picking out these themes from the uh, uh from the novel and um uh, and just to explain the metaphor um um ayn rand the ayn rand figure in the novel is uh described as a mosaic artist using truth as her tile so if a particular fact fits she uses it. If not, she clips it until it fits, and then she fills in the gaps with wholesale fictions. And so that's what it means to be a mosaic artist, using truth as one's tiles. And um, and the fact is, is that it's natural. All humans are mosaic artists. The, the beliefs that we assemble for ourselves, both individually and, and, and culturally, are built and designed to motivate us to to act. And the ones that survive are the ones that help us to survive and reproduce. There's your process of selection, cultural evolution among meaning systems. And so, uh, and so uh, abiding by the truth for that, for truth's sake, you'd never expect that from an evolutionary perspective, except in certain very narrow contexts. Or just to elaborate on that, because it is so important. Um, uh, the value of truth is very contextual. Sometimes the survival value of truth is very contextual. Sometimes it's very important to know things as they really are. There's a positive relationship between the truth of the matter and its survival value. But sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes flagrant departures from reality are more adaptive than the real thing. And so given that, what you expect of the human mind is a product of evolution 
is the ability to toggle back and forth seamlessly depending upon the context. And so it's not as if we can't discern the truth and never want to, uh, but it always depends on the um, uh, context. And so it's in that sense that we're all natural born mosaic artists, but under the right circumstances, we can hold each other accountable for the facts. And what we need to do now, of course, more than ever before, is to develop strong meaning systems, meaning systems that motivate us, get us out of bed in the morning, brimming with purpose, um, like a religion and like Ayn Rand's ideology for some people of objectivism, for some people, not at all for others, we need to create something like that, which scrupulously respects the facts of the world, scores high on factual realism and scores also high on what I and my, non, my nonfiction writing call practical uh, uh, realism. That's what's needed. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's it's certainly exactly what I've been trying to do with my work, um, with how much success we'll find out. Um, so in a, uh, you, you, you go into his education quite a lot, you pay quite a lot of attention to his initial school was the village school. Um, and then of course he graduates to university where he feels there's sort of a total lack of integration between the different jigsaw puzzle boxes of knowledge as you describe it. Um, but, but back at the village school, I mean, I've worked in education a lot myself and I'm very interested in different education models. Um, and the village school is based on the wisdom of a village. It's very outdoorsy, it's very um, embodied, um, and it sort of uses the wisdom that villages have evolved over millennia, sort of applies it in a school context. And there's this line, um, if there was a secret to peace on earth, perhaps it could be found by unlocking the secret of peace within a village. Um, so the obvious question is, what's the secret? Well, again, I'm so, such a delight talking with you and having you pick out the themes uh, that um, are indeed the themes that I was attempting to uh, emphasize. And there, from a nonfiction evolutionary perspective, it's the small group is the fundamental unit of human society as the natural human social environment, the only human social environment for most of our existence as a um, as a, um, a, a species. So if there's a utopia, it is the small group appropriately structured. And this is very, very important because everyone knows from their own experience that small groups function from the best to the worst. It's not the case that small groups of people trying to get something done together invariably function well. It's not, it is not extinctive in that way. But if there is the appropriate structure and if there is a sufficient reason for being in a group, like living, <laughs> surviving, uh, thriving. If a group are, of people are helping each other do that, and if there's mechanisms that suppress the cancerous, disruptive, self-serving behavior, that is the euphoric experience. And you find that again and again. You find that in soldiers during wartime, including my own father, who reported with their wartime experience as the best time in their life because of this experience of being in a group of people that had each other's backs and were and were helping each other survive and reproduce. And My so grandfather said something similar, in fact, in his war diaries. Oh, it's so common, it's so common. This is what natural disasters bring out also. There's a short story called The Open Boat by Stephen Crane, the novelist Stephen Crane, based on a real life experience where he was on a ship that sank off the coast of Florida, stormy seas. He found himself on a dinghy with three other people rowing through the storm towards shore. And they made it, one person died. Um, the rest of them made it. And in the story and in real life, he describes it as the best experience of his life and the love that he felt for these people that were total strangers before they found themselves together in that situation. So this is telling us that the human mind is really in a sense wired, although it's not purely instinctive. And so in my book, I needed to convey that theme of the village sized society as a kind of utopia. And so there's a number of them. There's the village school, there's a church community um, uh, that uh, Eve, the female protagonist, uh, 
uh, was raised uh, within. There's a biological station, um, and there's a redneck community. And so these are, you know, very very different uh, uh, communities, but they all share the ingredients of a small scale society working uh, uh, well. So that's another major theme of the book. It's interesting that you gave the example of you know someone uh, in a in a boat because in all the other examples there's at least a clear in group out group dynamic, and it seems that a lot of our successful attempts to integrate at higher and higher level of all, uh, levels of organization all the way from the bands to tribes to city states to nation states etc have always been at least in part pushed by competition with an out group. Um, but of course, at the global level, when we're trying to form an integrated global superorganism or organism, as you describe it, um, there is no outgroup. Um, so, do we need an outgroup? I mean, short of an alien invasion, where can we find the same impetus to unite? Right. So, the good news is, and now I'm crossing over into nonfiction, um, we do not need an outgroup. How nice it is to, to know that. Um, competition at any level between individuals, between groups, takes many forms. Sometimes it's direct competition, warfare, but not necessarily. Now Darwin said, uh, sometimes plants compete against the desert. I mean, if you have a drought resistant plant and a drought susceptible plant, and they're in a desert, then the drought resistant plant wins the Darwinian contest. The plants never interacted at all. And so you could simply have some groups that survive while others fall apart. And that would be a form of between group, uh, between group uh, uh, selection. I think that when you um, want to then think about cultural evolution at higher levels, and now we're beginning to talk about groups of groups of groups, ultimately the whole earth as the group. And it's here where religious concepts come in, Robert, um, um, especially the concept of the sacred. So when something is sacred, by definition, I mean, the definition of the word is when something is sacred, you place it above yourself. You make yourself subservient to it. That's what it means for something to be sacred. When something is profane, you use it as a tool for your own gain. And so what you find throughout history in both religious and non-religious formulations is when people make something sacred, then they are much more compliant than before. And they organize with respect to what is sacred. So just to talk about the earth is sacred, then what would that mean? It would mean, okay, everything we do has to be with that in mind, but that's not good enough because as we've just said, we're creatures of small groups. And so this has to be organized locally, very locally, in addition to globally and all intermediate levels in between. So this brings in multi-level governance, not just multi-level selection. Um, some of your readers probably uh, know about Eleanor Ostrom, the concept of polycentric governance. Uh, so this is something that has to be organized at multiple levels, but with the highest good in mind. And you think that, 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 that impulse to, yeah, to basically serve the earth is enough to drive global cooperation without any outgroup? Yes, and this idea that you need an outgroup, an alien from outer space, no. I mean, that would, even if that happened, it wouldn't work. Um, and evolution tells us that. Also, what we know from real disasters, real wars, where you don't have to imagine it, there actually is a big outgroup. We're at war now, okay? Well, my friend, the profiteering begins immediately. Mm. Immediately, people are profiteering off of that. Mm, and so, I mean, evolution is always about differences. If those aliens came, then within days, a small group of humans would approach them and say, let us be our lapdogs. We will deliver the rest of the human race to you. So, so um, it has to be um, um, uh, different from that and, and can be. And there's so many examples now at a massive scale. If you look at the, the um, Axial Age religions, uh, historically, this is where work, uh, again, I've crossed over into nonfiction mode, 
of Peter Turchin and wonderful research that's being done on uh, you know what was the emergence of the great religions, Christianity, Buddhism, um, uh, Confucianism, uh, what was happening then? And what these religions provided was a kind of a social glue that held society together at a larger scale than ever before. Tens of millions of people now had somehow become organized to be cooperative, um, always in the context of between group competition, warfare at a larger scale, but still the fact that this could happen is telling us that it can, we can ascend that final rung. We could actually do this in which the, in which the higher good is not our religion or our fatherland or, or no, no, it's the earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, although many people already are inclined that way, and we have great figures such as His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and the Pope and um, his um, encyclical and so on are actually speaking uh, for the whole earth. We have a, a scientific justification for it in multi-level selection theory more than ever uh, before. And that's the central uh, insight, the second breakthrough of John Galt Three in the book um, is to realize that, um, that um, uh, if you want to find a world free of suffering, self-imposed suffering, look inside any healthy organism and you will find a world that is free of self-imposed suffering. And so the key is to basically convert the whole earth into a single um, organism. That's his holy grail. That's actually my favorite line from the book and you've, you've stolen that away from my wrap up at the end. So I'll have to ad lib <laughs> something instead. Well, you, um, I, I still haven't given the line, so you're still welcome to do so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's just it is interesting that when you're trying to, you know, unify human groups and large things, it's sort of it, it, even if you're trying, to, even if you're sticking scrupulously to the facts, it takes on a religious flavor, whether you like it or not. And I think even in our secular world where we, we claim to have stripped absolutely all kind of re religiosity out of things, we end up attributing religious fervor to our political tribe or to our nation state, or it ends up creeping back in. Um, and, and there were one point in the book, you said that, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned the Buddha because you mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'm a meditator, I um, wonder if you are too. And, and you, you say that the, the Buddha's four noble truths can be understood in terms of natural selection. Um, I took Robert Wright's course. He did a he did a course online with something along those lines. But I wondered if you could explain to us how can natural selection explain or, or shed light on the Buddha's four noble truths. Well, the four noble truths are first of all that life is full of suffering. Okay, uh, and second one is suffering is caused by greed. Um, so those map on evolution just fine. I mean, evolution doesn't make everything nice. They what made Darwin's theory so troubling to everyone uh, was the fact that it doesn't make everything nice. The products of evolution kind of are, they benefit, often benefit me, not you, us, not them, short term over long term. And so evolution results in suffering. And this is very, very important because as far as the whole world is concerned, it's, it's a, a, another objective of the book. And again, crossing over into real life, so many people think that nature left to itself has somehow some kind of benign balance to it. They don't appreciate the suffering that takes place in animal societies and in, and in um, ecosystems. So many animal societies are just like horribly despotic in, in human terms. Imagine that you're in a relationship with someone who is just the, it's the worst relationship you could imagine. The person that you're living with is just using you for their own benefits. But sorry, sucks for you that if you tried to leave them, it would be still worse, okay? So imagine being in that relationship forever and for a species, animal societies to be like that for millions of years, because that's just the way the evolutionary forces change things, okay? So the worst kind of relationship or despotic um, um, societies. And so the idea that evolution results in suffering, there's the first one that is caused by greed. It's because all of these different agents are trying to maximize their fitness, not the fitness of the whole 
of the whole group. So there's your second noble truth. Then, of course, that there is a path to eliminate suffering and that uh, and Buddhism offers that, that path. Uh, and and so um, you must have been a good marketer to put the bad news first. <laughs> <laughs> and so what evolution does, and what the, the I mean the epiphany of John Galt Green is to say that uh, of course evolution accounts for the first two, but it's that fourth one that's important. And then when he realizes that um, that um, uh, turning the whole earth into a, an organism. Is is the evolutionary path to uh, to um, uh, enlightenment? So uh, so, and that can be justified entirely by science. So there's a lot to say, uh, Robert, about um, about uh, re relating that back to Buddhism. And I should just insert here that uh, I had the honor, as you might know, of actually having a conversation with His Holiness, um, sponsored by the. Um, Mind and Life Institute that took place just before the pandemic in November of last year, a one hour conversation that's um, online. And, and the main message I tried to convey was that so much about Buddhism, especially as practiced in the West, is about a transformation of one's inner life. Um, and so like the secret of, of uh, eliminating suffering is first of all, an inner transformation so that as an individual, you become compassionate, you lose a narrow sense of self, you see yourself as part of a larger uh, system. So the inner transformation is, um, is, um, is uh, necessary. And that's what so much of meditation is, is, um, is directed towards. But in addition to that, there needs to be an outer transformation. We need to work on our social structures in all of its forms and there, Buddhism as practiced in the West really falls short. There's an implicit assumption that if you become compassionate as an individual, then, then what you do in the world will just take care of itself. But that's not nearly uh, the case. And actually Buddhism, um, as it historically developed in India and in Tibet and so on, I did a lot of reading in preparation for that, um, that conversation in Tibet, it took place against the background of a feudal society and incessant warfare at various scales and never question the axioms of feudal um, um, uh, society. But at the very least, it consisted of such things as monasteries. And I mean, there was a whole social organizational development uh, a dimension to um, Buddhism, of course, which is not being addressed in uh, it's become so individualistic, ironically enough. And so transforming our outer lives and simple um, is an effort to, to uh, uh, do that, just to tie this back to, the, to this um, uh, YouTube channel, is an effort to um, uh, transform our outer lives in a particular, in a particular way. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I've followed your work closely um, with uh, Eleanor Ostrom and the eight principles of how to get cooperative organizations to work at all different levels of evolution. Um, and I know that you're familiar with Simple. I know you've spoken to John Bunzel um, a couple of times. And it seems to me, at least, that Simple is a pretty, has, has a pretty good crack at the eight principles. It seems to be, as far as I can see, pretty consistent with the eight principles necessary for cooperative organizations to work. So, it, you know, it, it has a sort of fair distribution of costs and benefits because policies are implemented simultaneously and are debated on a multi-issue framework. So there's a chance for yep. trade-offs mm -hmm. and everyone to win. Um, it has fair and inclusive decision-making. Um, it's, you know, achieved by public consultations. It's flexible enough to include democratic and non-democratic countries. Um, the monitoring of behaviors and the graduated sanctions can be applied by the voters themselves. You know, if, if, if the a country doesn't stick to the rules then they'll lose the voting block, um, you know, because simple aligns, anyway, I could go on and on. Um, but do you see it as consistent with those? I suppose the one, the one that sticks out for me that is the difficult one that it takes on a more religious flavor as we talked about is the strong group identity and understanding of purpose that we've sort of talked about in terms of this having the earth as a sacred object or, or however we, that comes about 
But the other seven, at least, do you see it as consistent with the principles when you when you looked at Simple? I see all eight. Why why make an exception? Uh, so uh, uh, it has a global focus. So why would you make an exception there? I mean, uh, the, the first principle is who is the group, and the whole Earth is a group. And so, but Simple is very strong on that point. So so. Uh, um, I see uh, simple as uh, being exemplary uh, that way, also exemplary in being incremental, that we need to actually do something that enables us to get there from here. So um, um, uh, I think one of the limitations of simple is that it, um, which means that it uh, is not a criticism, it just needs supplementation is that it is concentrates on the electrical process. And so, and so basically we need to find a way to, um, to get um, our politicians, our elected officials to first sign on to this agenda and for them to be voted in on the basis of that. So it's basically, it's working through formal governance. And of course that's um, absolutely needed. But in addition to that, there's so many forms of social interactions that do not require formal governance that we need to work on that too. So in my own efforts, we um, work in the first place directly with single groups to put in those very same principles. Those principles are scale independent, scale independent. Uh, they're needed by nations in the global village just as much as individuals in a in a real village. And so whenever any group whose members are trying to get something done, work together, that's a matter of cooperating. There's some general principles that um, they can be uh, uh, coached in. So there's a bottom-up component that's wonderful because no, no one needs permission. If yeah. you're a group out there and you want to work better, then visit prosocial.world. Mm. That's the nonfiction. Uh, a part of this. And then also there does need to be top down, but there's many organizations to work with. There's foundations, there's uh, right minded corporations, there's government agencies, um, so many uh, middle level uh, organizations and institutions that can apply the right kind of top down persistence. That's not that's not centralized planning. That's not done to that's done with not power over power with and any larger organization that gets that, then they're in a position to essentially orchestrate a cultural evolutionary process in which we formulate goals and we make those the target of selection. We orient variation around the target and we identify and replicate those practices. And we do it again and again and again. So, uh, so all of this can be done without governance. And in the book, Crossing Over into Fiction, that's what uh, uh, John Galtry accomplishes is a kind of a metamorphosis that uh, a little bit like simple. I mean, there are some <laughs> interesting um, uh, parallels in which he basically uh, is able to uh, create a, a, a new society with its own economy, with its own uh, judicial branch, with its own United uh, Nations, um, uh, just, um, um, that people can can join and they can not just uh, they can make a good living from it because it is a, a new basically a gig economy done right and so um, this is what the internet age makes possible uh, but of course only if we structure it the right way yeah um and, you know, and there, there's all sorts of room for intermediary structures that facilitate that process and but, but it does seem to me that the one piece of the puzzle that's lacking is the global level. Um, that there is no sort of decision-making body at the global level that can, that can bind the power of nation states, basically. Um, and, and is that not a, a key missing piece of the puzzle? It's, um, I want to say yes and no. Um, yes, but it doesn't have to begin there. And uh, I think it's always interesting to shrink problems down. So the things that are taking place at a large scale, ask yourself the question, um, what would it look like in a, in a group, a small group of individuals? And there you can imagine that in a small group of individuals, some are cooperators, others are not. 
how can the cooperators actually make things work? And, uh, and now if there's not enough of them, if they're in a true minority, then they can't, okay? Um, we know many models of cooperation which tell us that there's a threshold frequency that is required before cooperation can, can uh, uh, take, um, take root. But if there are enough, then they can do such things as confine their interactions with each other, um, that kind of clustering. Uh, they can impose sanctions on those that are not agreeing. They could work on a common sense of identity and, and purpose. Um, and so, and then they could actually bring that about. Basically, cooperation can win the, the um, Darwinian contest. And norms, uh, there's a lot of literature on this. You take norms such as um, the Me Too movement, and I would like to think norms of truth telling, uh, but let's focus on the Me Too movement, basically um, uh, sexual exploitation, sexual bullying of women and men, right? Uh, um, something that has taken place forever, uh, seldom approved, but often tolerated as just the way things are. But then something happens and a norm emerges. And it becomes outrageous and evil and unforgivable, these very same behaviors that have been taking place all along. And that's it's norms that's so powerful here. So so and so essential for explaining human sociality at, at, at a small scale. Um, a groups form norms, and then they hold each other to those norms. That's what moral systems are all about. And even though that's more difficult to establish at a large scale, it still happens at a large scale. And often it precedes the legal apparatus. Interesting. First it becomes outrageous and then you pass laws. And so I think the more people adopt norms of say truth telling and they enforce that, the more corporations are become like B Corps or triple bottom line corporations or so on, the more nations, and this has happened before where a nation would say, um, the way that my nation is going to be great is by being a leader among nations in establishing cooperation. That's what lay behind the United Nations, all these, these other uh, notions. There's a distinction between uh, basically dominance and reputation. I mean, two ways to get power are first of all, just to take it, that's dominance, or cultivate a good reputation which requires, of course, doing things for the common good. And so the more we can structure things so that um, any agent, individual, nation, corporation, religion distinguishes itself on the basis of the reputation that it cultivates, then there's this whole uh, uh, non-legal dynamic that can take place and then the laws can follow. So we hope the laws can lead, but the idea that we put everything into that is what is thankfully not uh, necessary. And that's the metamorphosis that uh, that uh, John Galt Plee brings it about in 100 days. <laughs> and another, another, uh, another theme of the book, which I love thinking about in, in um, uh, everyday life is the idea of catalysis, that in, in, in chemistry, a catalytic agent is something that you could add in small amounts to a chemical broth, and it increases the rate of the reactions by orders of magnitude without being used in, up in the um, process. The idea that rates of change can be catalyzed, and for that to be a possibility for cultural evolution, no less than chemical reactions that actually, if we know what to do, things can take place in a matter of years rather than decades. And for that to be a real possibility, the concept of catalysis actually makes that real. And, and I, I was going to ask you about that because because in the book it takes place, um, yeah, through, through him confronting his father in a sort of showpiece televised event and then leading a kind of um, uh, a sort of uh, trek, a hundred day trek to it. Well, not a hundred day trek, but anyway, leading a trek with a sort of procession. It, it has a very messianic um, 
uh, <laughs> sort of tones to it. Um, but in the real world, um, not to say none of that is possible, but in the real world, how do you see that catalyze, that catalysis coming about, given where we are now, given the resources that we have, um, given the movements that you see emerging? Where do you see that um, catalysis coming from? Well, so much depends on the theoretical um, orientation. So catalyzing, and this crosses right back over to, um, to nonfiction, uh, completing the Darwinian revolution, that um, the theory decides what you can see. My most recent nonfiction book, This View of Life, um, uh, begins with that, that, um, uh, that concept. And this is back to worldviews more or less um, um, being a kind of a, a, a genotype that depending upon what your what your worldview is, then that dictates what you do. So if you want to change things in the real world, you really must start in the mind um, and then and work on the the inner system in addition to the outer system. Um, so that means um, uh, making, accomplishing something that already has happened for the study of the natural world and extending it to the all things, all things human. If you look at that historically, what you find is in the first place, Darwin, knowing nothing about genes, uh, thought that his theory applied to all things human in addition to the rest of life. But with the discovery of genes and the advent of genetics, then the study of evolution became restricted to genetic evolution for most of the 20th century. And cultural change and personal change just got relegated to other disciplines. And so, you know, the decades went by and by the 1970s, Theodosius Dobzhansky could say, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, that took decades by itself, right? If you look at any particular controversy, even things like continental drift, which we look back and we say, well, of course, continents drift, but it took like, you know, 50 years to establish that. Yeah, that's how long science takes, uncatalyzed. Mm -hmm. And then as to, and so there's no doubt of the way things are trending that Darwin's theory, in fact, is being applied to, to um, all things, uh, all things human. There's a huge literature on it. We love, I mean, a whole entire genre of, of, um, of books on it, but still it will take decades and mm. decades. And, and economics is the poster example. I mean, economics is the most static profession ever. I mean, when I'm not in my you know, normal life, in my nonfiction life, we're talking about this um, all the time. When is economics ever going to change? When is it ever going to depart from its physics? I can um, remember seeing a, somebody did a um, pictographic representation of different disciplines and how they linked to other disciplines. So how interdisciplinary was their research? So in, in a research paper or a paper published in the economics, how many different other disciplines did it cite? And you have across all of academia, this beautiful web where all these disciplines are citing other disciplines left, right and center. And then economics was just this little bubble <laughs> that yeah. was like not referencing anything outside of itself. And it was just yeah. in a world of its own, literally. Now that's something that can be catalyzed. I mean, I think we could look at that and we could say, we could do something about that and that's, and, and in fact, um, it has happened and I'm proud to have played a role in it. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna come across as arrogant, but, um, to have, um, in my 10 years of involvement, to have really moved the needle quite a bit, along with the journals such as um, magazines, such as economics.com and, and so on and so forth. There's tipping points, there's huge non-linearities, non but we can truly do something that, that causes this to happen in years, not, not, um, and not decades. And when we're appropriately oriented and more and more people think, for example, that our primary social identity needs to be citizens of the earth. And then we need to organize things below it. Uh, and the more Leviathan organizations do that. Um, for example, 
Um, we're working with Shopify, which is the second largest online retailer in the world after Amazon.com. Works with a million merchant clients, uh, valued at over $80 billion in assets. And the COO, Toby Shannon, I have a podcast with him. We could provide the, the, the link to. He gets it. And he says, I want, my, I want Shopify to be present 100 years from now. And in order to do that, we need to work on the whole ecosystem. Let's do that. Mm. And let's use these ideas. Let's use these ideas top to bottom. Let's use these ideas for our, our groups of consultants that work with our clients in top management and how we work with other organizations. And as soon as you get Leviathan organizations doing that, if you got Apple or Google or Amazon to actually see the light and then to understand that the genius of what they do could be applied to the whole earth as a system, you'd be there. And so it's the mental transformation that comes first. And after that, I mean, it, 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 it could happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because obviously there's so many examples of corporations and governments that seem to be going in that direction. Um, you know, I'm, even there's a political party in Denmark called The Alternative and their slogan is a Denmark that is good for the world. Um, yeah. So so it's certainly not impossible. It's just that my worry is without without some form of global governance, the 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 opportunity to free ride will be too great and and you know we won't be able to stop amazon avoiding tax and we won't be able to stop nations pulling out of the climate agreement with no ramifications um but but i do take your point about the norms and the power of that and and you know hopefully hopefully the momentum carries on and you know there is some kind of catalyzation process maybe we can we can trend sound like so that's certainly something interesting to think about um I wanted to ask as well, because you talk about the, the, there is this very important relationship, as you pointed, between inner and outer change. And just as, um, you know, there's, it's no good to just focus solely on, on, on yourself and your own individual consciousness. Equally, I think relentlessly pursuing outer change, but without trying to change yourself is also an error. Um, I wonder how familiar you are with uh, integral theory, which is a sort of... Um, well, it's an evolutionary worldview, but applied to not just the outer world, but to the inner world as well. And it talks a lot about spirituality and spiritual growth and frames those in terms of evolution. Um, but certainly there were some aspects of the book that certainly touched on them. I mean, at least in the sense that John Galt III is putting forward a meaning making system that is, in a sense, conscious. It's not, as you say, prone to just the sort of blind forces of cultural selection. He's, just, he's in a sense, looking forward into the future and thinking, aha, like what actually what kind of meaning making system does humanity need if we're to survive and flourish? And, and that has strong parallels to sort of second tier in, in, in integral theory or, or conscious evolution. And he's also very integral as a person. He's, you know, he makes friends with the redneck, he makes friends with the Christian community. So I wondered if how familiar you are with that body of work and, 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 and yeah, how, how you view that in connection with this move towards a more cooperative global society. Yeah, I am familiar with it. And I have a number of interviews with Ken Wilbur um, that were great. Uh, so, and let me broaden the view a little bit. I'm very happy that you um, uh, led the conversation in this, uh, in this direction to um, an entire movement that's sometimes called the interspiritual movement of which uh, integral dynamics is one strand. So, uh, to think how to uh, organize my um, um, organize my uh, thoughts on this. Uh, my main person I work with there is named Kurt Johnson, who's a good friend of Ken Wilbur, who introduced me to to Ken. And the way that Kurt Kurt is uh, has a PhD in evolution, just like me. Uh, he was a butterfly systematist, and he worked on the same group of butterflies as the novelist uh, Vladimir Nabokov. And there is an interesting story because Nabokov had a whole scientific career and developed an elaborate theory of this systematics and biogeography of this particular group of butterflies called the blues, which was um, ridiculed by other entomologists until the advent of genetics, genetic phylogenies, 
which validated Nabokov. And so Kurt has written two books on Nabokov's scientific uh, 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 career. And Kurt became an ordained Episcopal monk at the same time that he got his PhD. So, so um, Kurt truly has a foot in both worlds. And Nabokov, Nabokov is also the the novelist, and in his novels he talks about butterflies a lot. Can that be a coincidence? Yeah, yeah no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, that's a very, very, um, uh, so I'm proud to join the ranks of scientist um, um, uh, novelists. Not that I'm trying to compare myself with, with uh, Nabokov. Uh, but um, the way that Kurt describes uh, inner spirituality is that he says all spiritual and religious traditions, along with many secular traditions, converge upon an awareness of rich interconnectedness, rich interconnectedness. And once you really appreciate that, certain ethical conclusions follow, namely the futility of using one part of the system to attack another part of the system. It impels you to take a systemic approach in your ethical decisions. And so the appreciation of rich interconnectedness creates this tier of consciousness, which is called second tier consciousness that enables people to come together no matter what their particular tradition, their first tier consciousness. They do not necessarily abandon their first tier consciousness, but they can actually go beyond it in a way that enables them not just to appreciate, but even to sample other traditions in a way they couldn't uh, uh, before. And this is why we can understand why purely secular traditions such as environmentalism do have that spiritual quality that you comment upon your, yourself. Uh, deep ecology, for example, the Norwegian environmentalist Arne uh, Ness, or how someone like Ken Wilber, uh, such an inquiring mind that college could not contain him. He dropped out of college because his college education was just too um, parochial, um, and then developed his uh, integral dynamics, uh, which is um, a secular, I mean, it's a, it's a commitment to, um, not to not to indulge in supernaturalism of any, of any kind, and, but to form a, a spiritual system out of that. And there's many, uh, there's a group called the Evolutionary Leaders, hundreds of them, over a hundred of them that are, and Barbara Marks Hubbard is someone that you mentioned, you know, she, you might not have, her particular version might not be to your taste, but she's definitely part of the tribe. And conscious evolution is something um, uh, that uh, comes naturally to them. Uh, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and his um, Amiga point, uh, ecology of the Gaia uh, a variety. So what they've done, and this is like a true archipelago. I mean, this is, so many people have been formulating narratives along these lines that are only loosely coupled to each other. We'll get back to, to, um, to that because that archipelago structure is, is, becomes part of the problem. So many people driving in the same direction with their narratives is a sign of vitality in some sense, but really becomes part of the problem in another sense. There has to be some kind of unification and uh, to be able to describe these in more general terms. And that's one of the things that evolutionary theory uh, provides is a, a way to describe this in general, um, a general term. Uh, but in any case, um, a, a, another point I wanna make is that this is where my own field of evolutionary biology gets in the way. When I said earlier that the study of evolution was confined to genetic evolution for most of the 20th century, Part of that was an absolute dogma that evolution has no purpose. If you want to get thrown out of the academy as an evolutionist, just try saying that evolution could be conscious. And you will just, I mean, uh, and yet when we think about it, and I've, there's plenty of nonfiction writing on this that I can, I can um, uh, 
I'm sure I've read lots of it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, especially when it comes to human cultural evolution. It's not even true for genetic evolution anymore. So just check into the extended evolutionary synthesis. There's your keywords, extended evolutionary synthesis. You'll see that all the way back to the Baldwin effect, I'm sure that you're familiar with that. The idea that- Actually, no, no, remind me the Baldwin effect. It's the idea that, that behavioral choice guides genetic evolution. Right, okay. First, yeah. So blind evolution creates organisms that are not blind, that are directed in their behavior. And then the directed behavior of organisms feeds back to affect the genetic evolutionary process. And that goes for human cultural evolution with a vengeance. The idea that that human cultural evolution lacks an intentional component, that people aren't just trying to just trying to do stuff. Um, you can't. And at the same time, uh, cultural evolution also has a huge blind component. And intentions become blind when they collide with each other. And so what's needed is for cultural evolution to be more intentional than ever before. And that's what it means to, to, to uh, basically manage the process of cultural evolution. In my nonfiction work, you can summarize it by saying every form of positive change at every scale from, from the personal all the way up to the, to the global must be a managed form of evolution. And if we don't manage it, it will take us where we don't want to go. I can promise you that. So all forms of positive change is managed, conscious, cultural evolution. That's what's, uh, what's, what's needed. And, and, and there are many positive examples. It's so, honestly, it's so refreshing to hear someone from academia say that because it certainly does feel like a dogma from the outside. I mean, it seems to me when I look at the evolutionary process, but it's very clear that there's at least some directionality there and there's definitely purpose in it. Um, and, you know, that it even seems to me just on an individual level that I can become more intentional and more purposeful through my behaviors. You know, I can meditate for a week and I can become very conscious and very intentional about my behaviors. Or I can sit on the sofa and watch TV for a week and I'll be quite unconscious of my behaviors and my behaviors will flow from a much deeper programmed biology you know that i'll be i'll get angry when I, my instincts tell me to or I'll, i'm more likely to reach for a bar of chocolate or drink another glass of wine it seems to me very obvious that it's really within our power how how intentional our cultural evolution becomes yeah and, and let's uh, elaborate on that robert because uh, um, with individual therapy i work very closely with steve hayes who's the founder of acceptance and commitment um, um, He's got a wonderful quote, um, survival of the most adaptable is far truer to the whole of evolutionary data than survival of the fittest. I've bandied that about a whole lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so amazing that uh, what therapy and training is, first of all, therapy and training, you need therapy when you're really badly off. Everyone can benefit from training, even the most elite athletes, the same principles apply. So no matter what your current level of fun of functioning um uh, you can benefit from these from these um, uh, processes. And what ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy slash training is, is nothing less. And, and Steve is increasingly formulating it in, in, this, uh, in this way as a managed process of, culture, of personal, personal evolution. You have your symbotype, your, everything in your head. And then you have the world of action. And the, the exercises literally involve a dialectic between the way we think and the way we act. The, the, those sometimes taking us towards our valued goals, sometimes taking us away from our valued goals. When we perversely are doing things that are against our valued goals, that's because actually that's forms of evolution taking us place where we don't want to go. They're actually benefiting us in some shrunken way but are part of the problem in terms of normatively. We have to learn, we have to recognize them. We have to work around them. And all of the work that's done is, uh, could be thought of as a form of managed personal uh, evolution, including our inner lives and our outer lives, tightly coupled with each other. And then when we work with groups, we've taken that and we've applied the same thing at the group level, the same tools at the group, at the group level. So this is, I think, when anyone can avail themselves of 
right now without asking any permission. Uh, they can just do it. Just learn about it and do it. Do it for yourself as an individual, but even more, do it for yourself as a member of a group. Get involved in groups that are doing meaningful things and uh, you will thrive as an individual and you will be more efficacious at larger scales than anything that you might have tried to do on your uh, own. And go to prosocial.world, www.prosocial.world, learn more about Simpol and, uh, and many other like-minded uh, organizations. I might mention Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics as a something which is centered in the UK um, and, um, and is just an awesome uh, framework for, uh, for going from the global to the, to the, uh, um, uh, to the uh, local. There really has to be a gathering of the clan as far as, um, as, far as uh, uh, these like-minded movements are, uh, are concerned. And there is, that's something else that's, that's um, uh, being, being catalyzed. Just makes me optimistic. Yeah, well, I, I don't need to worry about the wrap up because you basically wrapped up very perfectly for me. Um, <laughs> I do have one final question, um, which is, so, you know, you, are, you, you explicitly have come out to a certain degree and, and um, you know, stated the case for a kind of global um, organism or, you know, it's a global cooperation and, and this, um, you know, tide of evolutionary thinking towards greater, greater integration on, 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 on more and more scales and all different levels. Um, why do you think more, I mean, basically, I think we need more academics to come out and publicly support that. And I know, as you say, the idea of purpose in evolution is a real taboo and there's certain dogmas within academia, but there must be other academics, particularly within the field of evolutionary science, who can see what you can see and what I can see. And uh, why don't more of them come out and support these kind of kinds of statements more publicly? Is it fear of fear of judgment? No, I think it gets back to the rates of cultural um, evolution. In the first place, there's a lot of people. Uh, I would describe the, my like-minded community of people, numbers in the thousands, uh, all disciplines, uh, coming out with this message in wonderful, wonderful books. Joseph Henrik is one of my favorite people. His book, The Secret of Life. Um, no, the, the uh, oh. The meaning of our success, the secret of our success, and then his new book, uh, the weirdest people in the world, just marvelous. So I mean, there's there's lots. They publish in the best journals. There's there's more books than you can read that are um, that are um, uh, spreading this. That's the good news. The bad news is that's still a tiny, tiny fraction of the worldwide community. And on that note, I mean, I talk with so many people, some of them are like the most open-minded, widely read, futuristic, knowledgeable about technology, knowledgeable about complex systems, and still this evolutionary piece of it is new to them. They're newly encountering it. And when they do, it's like mind candy. They love it. There's no barriers. There's no barriers, but that's how new it is. And so catalysis means just basically bringing it to their attention, providing opportunities to talk about it, writing about it, and not just providing a passive reading experience, but then organizing discussion groups on the basis. Of it. it truly is like a catalytic molecule. You take agents, you hold them together, bring them together, orient them in a way that they bond to each other. They basically, they continue interacting with each other and then you are released to repeat the, the, um, uh, the process. And so um, this is the kind of thing that uh, an academic culture, we've already talked about economics, but actually most academic culture is highly static, not flexible, stuck within its disciplinary silos. That's why it's taking as long as it is. And that is something that truly can be catalyzed. It's still hard work. I mean, and, and, it, and, um, and in fact, that's uh, a theme of the novel is that they begin their catalytic work in the ivory tower, in academia, 
and that goes on for four years and um, and um, is just totally out, unknown beyond its its borders. Then a different kind of catalysis is uh, is um, is needed. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap up, David. I just want to say to everyone, um, do check out Atlas Hugged, um, check out Evonomics, uh, check out uh, This View of Life magazine, check out prosocial.world. Um, David's had his hand in all of these. Um, and and whatever I suppose you know every every person out there is going to connect with this in a different way or different pieces of the puzzle are going to speak to them more. Um, but like you said, there's a huge amount out there that we can learn and that we can do, and the world needs did, that positive purpose and intention more than ever. Did you have a passage that you were gonna that you were gonna? Oh yes, quote? yeah yeah. My favorite line. Here we go. The line is. To find a world free of suffering, look inside any healthy organism. Yep. That was my favorite there line. There we go. The Wonderful. Um, all right. Thank you very much, David. And uh, see you all next time with the next episode of Simple Insights. Thanks very much.